Hi, my name is Luke. And one thing that I am learning to give God glory in my life that I used to claim for self is the use of my time. The use of my time and that I used to come to work and work hard and then at the end of the day when I'm tired, I would wanna claim my right to go home and disconnect from my family. Rather if that be video games or watching TV or scrolling on my phone, it was disconnecting from my wife and my daughter. And now I'm learning through scripture, this verse that stands out to me is Matthew 6, It says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. And in that, God is teaching me that I need to submit more and all of my time to him. That it's not just to compartmentalize my time for him, but it's to truly be able to have the opportunity to get to go home after work and pour into my wife in my daughter and love on them and show them the love of Jesus at home. What is it for you that you need to surrender for God so that he gets the glory in your life? Well, happy Father's Day to you. It's good to be with you. I love this testimony because it challenges, I think all of us to say, what is primary for us uh, what are we giving our life to? And that's certainly what our text is going to respond to today. Uh, if you don't know, this is our friend Ian. You can say hello, Ian. Um, he is uh, somebody who works here at Chapel Point, serves this church well. So thanks for that, buddy. Um, thanks for helping me out because when he woke up today and he came to church, he didn't know he was going to be helping me out. Um, and uh, so, but he was willing to. That, if we could pick that up. This is, uh, and then let's go with this here. This is going to represent your life. Yes. This represents your life. You're doing great. Um, so in your life, you have to start thinking about what is it that you want to be known for? What are the things that we want to be known for? You've seen this before, but just go with me for a moment here because it's going to help you out maybe. Um, so this is your life, and you start to fill your life up with things that you want to be known for. I'll give you a few examples. Then I'll let you call some things out, but behave, okay? Um, so... Let's go with this. I want to be known for what, we, what you wear. That was close. Um, you want to be known for how you dress, and you actually every day, if somebody doesn't compliment you on how you dress, you, it messes with you, right? Some of you want to be known for what vehicle you drive, right? And so you can't drive too bum of a car or too nice of a car. That's a very real thing, right? We've spoken about that too. Um, I could drive a $75,000 pickup truck and I'm, it's fine, but if I drive a $30,000 Mercedes and I am using my money improperly and I'm going to hell. All right. That's a real thing. Isn't that how we are? Isn't that weird? That's a West Michigan thing. It's so strange. So strange. Um, and then some of you want to be known for not only what you wear, what drive you car, but maybe the, where you live, right? Um, you can live in Hudsonville, maybe Jenison, but not Granville. Don't care. Um, so then some of you want to be known for what friends you hang out with, maybe at school or maybe even the moms that you hang out with or the fathers that you hang out with, all these different things. And you start going, man, how about my job or, or, or my career or where I went to school or what sports that I like or don't like, right? Or what food you eat or what you drink and maybe what you're known for in terms of activities. Yesterday, you ran a marathon. Good job. Um, you should be able to. You're 23. Good for you. Um, uh, you see how I just discredited that? Um, I did a Tough mutter yesterday, and I'd like to let you know that I barely was able to get up to walk out on the stage. Okay. We have all these other things. So give me something that we like to be known for. Call some things out. Cottage, running a Tough mutter. Somebody call that up. Oh, wow. They got you there. What are, uh, two words, right? What are we going to say to him? Not good job. <laughs> the words are get out. Get out. Actually, I respect your game, but I will cut you. Okay, so what else do we like to be known for? A motorcycle? So get off of my toes. All right. Okay, I don't know what you said. That's great. Technology, whether you have an iPhone or a Samsung. If you have an iPhone, you're remotely cool. If you have a Samsung, not at all. How much you work out? How much you work out? How strong you are. How the same, okay, yeah, how strong you are, how weak you are. 
Here, Jesus Christ, thank you. That was a child that did it. And you don't have to buy anything for your father's now for Father's Day because you win. Um, so you got all these things that make up your life. We know this already. And then what happens is then you have God. We, you've seen this before, right? You only have so much space before it starts to, 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 to fill up. And yet you've only used less, not even half of the bottle. That's what happens. We want to be known for so many different things, and yet we don't have enough room to glorify God. That's what the passage is about today. We want to be known for tech. We want to be known. Guys, average person spends almost four hours a day on their phone. That's the new number. Almost four hours a day. That's ridiculous. And then we say, but I don't have time to read the Bible. Really? But I don't have time to come to church and to serve. Really? No, you just have different priorities. So now because I'm getting old, I just tell people that. I don't go, oh, okay, well, maybe one day. I go, no, you just don't have the priority right. Because this is what happens. So then what we really need to be doing, may I? So we do that, and then we do this here, right? And we fill this up, and that is what we're living for. God's glory, God's purpose. We've talked about that many times. And now as we add the different parts, when I add career, it better still give glory to God. When I add fitness or whether it be what car I drive or all these different things, what team I cheer for, it still has to, and if there's not enough room, it's not God that I'm removing, it's all the other things. You're following me, yes? That's what we have to understand today. Um, again, I think you've done a remarkable job. Most successful thing you've ever done, good job. Good job. Good. Thank you. Good. And I'll give you that too. Perfect. I love harassing him, but I'm going to get it tomorrow. So that's fun. That is what the passage is about. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Now remember, we added chapters and verses later in life, okay, to try to help people find everything and to be able to, you know, to, be able to go right to it. So we added chapters and verses. If we look at this text, Chapters 8, 9, and 10 of 1 Corinthians, which is the series restored that we've been in for quite a while now. Chapters 8, 9, and 10 really fit together in one big lump sum. That would be a section that would help us identify a lot of different things in our lives. And at the end of the day, it's all about, hey, you better deal with the idols. You better deal with all these difficulties because your job is to give glory to God. So here's Paul writing from Ephesus, writing to the people of Corinth who a lot of them don't know right? They're not Jewish. They don't know all the history. They don't know all the stories of the Israelites and stuff like that. And he's using this to teach them and go, oh no, your job is to give glory to God, but you're not giving glory to God because you're getting so distracted by the ways of the world and by all these idols that you have in your life. And so he's addressing this. And because, then some of them are saying, but you don't understand. I have certain freedoms in life. I have certain liberties in life. And he's going, no, 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 no. Any liberty you have, you have to balance that as a believer. Any liberty that you have, any freedom that you have, you have to balance that with responsibility. Liberty and responsibility has to be, have to be put together. And he's telling them, no, but you have a responsibility to live in a way that gives God glory. Two questions that you probably need to learn to ask yourself before you make any decision in life. Those are big words, by the way. The majority of your life, you walk around, you make decisions. What you speak, that's a decision that you make. What you choose to do to someone, that's a decision that you make, right? Anything you choose to pur purchase or look at it with the screen, it's a decision you make. Two things, two questions you have to ask. One, does it glorify God? That's a simple one. It's not simple, but you knew that was coming. Does it glorify God? Second question, and this is just looking at scripture to help us evaluate the decisions that we, we make. Does it edify others? Does it glorify God? Does it edify others? Does it glorify God? Does it edify others? Does it glorify God? Does it edify others? Okay, ready? Does it, and does it, that's what you have to ask yourself. That is what you have to ask yourself. And that's an opportunity we have to look at today. This text, the remainder of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 14 through 33, uh, it's really three different movements. So I'm covering a lot of text today, but it's three different movements. Some of it is, I would say it's a little bit of regurgitating that that was already previously stated in these chapters, eight, nine, and 10. And so we get to look at it right now. So would you please go ahead and stand for the reading of the word of God? We're gonna be looking first at 14 through 22. You only have three words to read. You can do it today on this part. 
All right. So let's go ahead and jump into this. Therefore, my beloved, I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless is not a participate. Is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of one bread. Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar? What do I imply then? That food offering is to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No, I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. Meaning, we always act like there's, here's a big line, here's a big line, and we're somewhere in that great chasm of spirituality and who we are with Christ. No, there is a line. You're with God or you're without God. Like you've got it, there's a line. You can't, you can't live for self and for Jesus. Doesn't work that way. I know we want it to. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? The answer to that would be no, right? Are we stronger than he? This is the word of God. You may be seated. Let me unpack this for you. The biggest rock we can throw in the pond to create ripples is all that matters. That's called giving God glory. And giving glory is the biggest rock that we can throw in that pond. You, you, you grew up, we all went and we would want to skip rocks along the water. Who went skip rocking? I just made that term up. All right, rock skipping. All right, um, you're not giving glory to God right now. You would go, would you go get the biggest, heaviest, most round rock you could find to go skip across a lake? Yes or no? No, you go get a nice what? Flat rock. Some of you got that wrong. You need to be educated. Um, nice flat. You skip it across. And normally I didn't do that well. I would get like 120 skips. And so you would go and skip as much as you could. Well, that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to make the biggest ripple we can for the kingdom of God as believers in Jesus. Yes or no? That's what we want to do. And giving God glory in all things at all times is the greatest way that we can do that. And so he says, the reason you're not creating a bigger ripple, here's a very simple, simple way to think about it, is because you have idols. So once again, he says, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. He keeps talking about this over and over. This is the first movement that he tackles. He's like, flee, run, right, from idolatry. He speaks about this numerous times, eight, nine, and 10, keeps talking about idolatry, idolatry, idolatry. And in, in this passage, idolatry, as I said it last week, I've said it new, uh, so many times throughout my ministry. This is what idolatry is. Idolatry is giving greater worth to anything than that which you have given to God. And none of us wake up in the morning and go, man, let me identify my idols. If you do, wow, that's what I would say. But he's identifying the idols that they have and the struggles that they're having. And he's like, your job is to give God glory. The reason you're not giving God glory is because you're buying in to the idols of the world. Remember, Paul from Ephesus to Corinth, trading hub full of sexual immorality, 26 at least, 27 temples that we know of that they had to worship other gods because they would just create whatever God, whatever idol they wanted to be able to worship in order to do what they wanted to do. And so they just kept coming up with other stuff. Over and over and over and over again, we know that. So they kept doing it and because they had idols, they wanted certain particular things in their life. And so they would come out with it. And so then he says, flee from idolatry, run from idolatry. Stop giving worth to things in a more significant way than you give worth to knowing God, to glorifying God. And so he talks about it. He talks about it when it comes to, hey, by the way, the cup of blessing that we bless, that's participating with the blood of Christ. So they did know the Lord's Supper. He introduced that to them, right? Don't you know that even the bread that we are there and we're partaking of the one bread? Right? He knew that, listen, that when we take the Lord's Supper, that's symbolic. We don't literally think that's the blood in the body of Christ. But he's going, don't you know that we're participating with Christ in that? We're acknowledging it. We're recognizing what he has done on our behalf. 
And so you need to know that what you're eating in that moment is recognizing, symbolizing your belief and your understanding of who Christ is. He then goes back in verse 18, he says, consider the people of Israel. Well, last week, beginning of chapter 10, he says, don't you know about the people of Israel? He is educating them because they're not a bunch of Jewish people here. We make these understandings of like, oh, they should know all this. No, some of them are learning. This is a new church, new believers in Corinth. He's gone to that place, spent how, how, how long did he spend there? 18 months. And now he's gone, he's in Ephesus, he's writing back to them and he's telling them, hey guys, you gotta remember Israel. I've already told you about them, consider them. Are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar? What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No, I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. What he's saying, because he's addressed this in 1 Corinthians chapter eight, Verse four, he said, listen, you can eat the food that's offered to idols. That's not the issue because we know that the idol's not real. It's not about that. Do you remember this? Just say yes. Okay, good. All right. We already know that. First Corinthians chapter eight, verse four. It's not about eating that. But he does go on to say, but wait a second. If it's going to damage your witness or distract others or lead them astray because they can't handle it, just don't do it. And you certainly don't eat that food that was offered to an idol sitting down in a pagan temple, which is gonna confuse others because they're going to identify that with being someone who is acknowledging that God in their life. Why would you do that? He says, don't do it. This is why they're struggling. Did you know that there are certain areas in life that are very black and what? Black and white, yeah. Certain, like if I came to you and said, hey, such and such cut me off. Do you think I should kill them? What's the answer to that? It's, that's a black and white. You're going, well, that's silly. Well, because it's such a black and white. You don't do that. New York, maybe. But okay, I, you don't do that. But there are other areas in life that are they're gray. We don't like grays. That's why we've come up with a lot of rules in our life. That's why we, we say we don't, Remove from scripture and we don't what? We don't add to scripture. But we've added a lot of rules because we'd rather have a rule that we can understand and define than live in grace. So we make up rules, right? Everybody think of a rule that we've made up that actually have just defined us as whether or not we're a good Christian. Do you cut your grass on Sunday? First of all, that's not even the real Sabbath. So let's talk about that if you wanna go down that road. I'm serious. We make up all these rules. Another, I remember first time I ever went um, on a Sunday afternoon, I went to a movie. I said it real quick, cause it was bad. I, I went to, my family got letters. My father was a pastor. My, they got letters like, oh, you're not fit to serve. Um, but I went to see the story of Moses. It doesn't matter, you're going to hell. Like it was bad. I truly, like that was a long time ago, right? We make up all these rules because we like rules. And we can't stand living in the gray, but what he does here, he goes, listen, some things are black and white, but some things are gray. So, hey, listen, is it wrong to eat the, the food that's offered to idols? We know that the especially during Passover, listen, Jerusalem would swell by over four times the number of people that it would typically have just at Passover and all these sacrifices are coming. I, I went through some of this recently, right? And a third of the meat would go to the priest that was being offered after a sacrifice and they couldn't eat all that meat. And so what would they do to it? They'd sell it. Make a little money on the side, maybe, whatever. And then here they are, they're selling it. And is it wrong to eat that? That was offered to an idol, that the idol's not even real. It's not, but you're not gonna sit. But, so take it with you and eat it, that's fine. But don't sit with the people in the pagan temple and then and, and let it be seen as though you're worshiping that idol and, and don't do that. So there's grace here and you have to figure it out. I'll give you another gray in our life today. Drinking is a huge gray. You wanna know why? Because the scripture never says do not drink, period. What it says is don't give to drunkenness, and then it says, don't jeopardize your witness and influence others negatively. That's what it says. So we make this rule that if somebody had a glass of wine, oh no, no, that's not what scripture says. Yes, I've had wine, oh no. 
And yes, it was real in the Bible. They couldn't drink the normal water a lot of times. There's other reasons for it because it was bad. It was contaminated, all these different things. They couldn't do it. Why? They didn't have all the things that we have today. And so cows would have just done things in that water. They had to ferment it. Notice it, right? You have to learn all this. But we don't like that. And so we create rules. But what it does say is, man, never give to drunkenness. What it does say is don't drink if it's gonna be a negative witness of who you are. And if, if, listen, just because someone's not as spiritually mature as you, let's say if some, you've, been, you've known Christ for five years. If you've known Christ for five years and the word, you should be all about some Jesus, amen? And there's no more convincing. Like there's a radical movement of God. You're being transformed on a continual basis. And if that's you and you find somebody who's a new believer, they don't understand all this. Just don't drink, don't drink around. Would you, why would you do that? So you can claim your own liberty and like, I, but I have freedom. No, what did you do? You gave that right up to Jesus Christ. You said, I have liberty and I have freedom in Jesus. We talk about it all the time. And so because I have liberty and freedom in Jesus, I am now going to surrender that to become a slave of the most high God through Jesus Christ who died for me so that I could have eternal life. That's what we get to do. I'm riled up today <laughs> because it's Father's Day and I get the right. I'm claiming my right. Right? No, no, that's what we do. We claim our rights. Stop. Stop. So we got with drinking. We get another way we really claim our rights is the way we dress. Like I, I look at people today and I'm like, put clothes on. <laughs> Ladies, I'm sorry, and, and men too, both. I'm gonna say it both. You don't recognize that what you wear impacts other people. Remember, we got two questions. Does it glorify God and does it edify others? Guys and girls, some people, because I don't want to hear like afterwards, like, oh, you didn't address the guys. But we know primarily that the way girls dress, it matters a lot. And you go, but this is popular. It doesn't matter. You gave up your rights, your liberties in order to make sure you're edifying others and not leading them astray. I don't get one amen for that. That doesn't count. I had to ask you for it. I, I, it matters. But when I know you can't tell me what to do, he's going to know. But if you're negatively impacting other people and he's jumping into this and he's telling them, that's why you've got so many idols that are so ingrained, those idols are filling up that cup. And because of it, you're not willing to give them up. Those are just real life issues that we have right there that I'm trying to call out. That's what he's speaking to here. And he, does, he tells them, you can't do both. You can't, you can't drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You, you can't partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Verse 21, you cannot do it. So he's helping them go. If you want to glorify God, get rid of the idols and acknowledge what they are. That's part of what he does here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And then he jumps into 23 through 30. 23 through 30. And this is what he says. In fact, don't even put it up there. Before you do this, I will go to 1 Corinthians 6, 12. Might want to jot that one down. 1 Corinthians 6, 12. I want to read it for you. This is what it says. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, not all things are helpful. You heard this a couple months ago. All things are lawful, not all things are helpful. He also says in other translations, simply because something is permissible doesn't mean it's beneficial. Simply because it's permissible doesn't mean it's beneficial. So you give it up if it's not beneficial. You may have the right to do it, but you don't live that right out if it's going to negatively impact your witness of Jesus Christ. You give it up. That's called spiritual maturity, my friends. If you have somebody who's going to stomp their feet and bury their heels in the dirt and say, you can't tell me what to do. I, can do, I have the right to do this. Then what you have encountered is somebody who is spiritually immature because you have surrendered those rights in order to glorify God. So he says, 1 Corinthians 6, 12, all things are lawful, not all things are helpful. Now you jump over 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 23, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, once again, but not all things build up, edify, right? Glorify, what does it glorify God? Does it edify others? There it is. But not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor and eat whatever is sold in the meat market 
without raising any question on the ground of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If any, if one, right, any, one of the believer, unbelievers invites you to dinner and you're disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. Right? If something's offered to you and it was a food to idol, but you're just being offered and it's not in the context of the pagan temple and looking like you're trying to worship another God, fine, take it. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice to that false God, and making a deal out of it, then don't eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. I do not mean your conscience, but his. Now read this with me. For why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? Don't we hate, oh, we don't like that. Why should my rights be determined by that other person's immaturity or their emotions? Everything you do says something about you. I've raised my kids on that plus many other sayings, all found in scripture. You will find that here. That's where this one, everything you do says something about you. That is found, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Everything you do says something about you. What you speak says something about you. The way you dress says something about you. If I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced? Because of that for which I give thanks. I know you can eat what you want, but it's just not worth it at some point. If it's not going to hinder anybody else, fine. If you want a glass of wine, fine. But don't, don't, why would you drink? Like if they only see that as somebody, if other people, they're struggling, don't drink around them. Why would you do that? Why don't you seek others good? I, I, I love it here. It says, listen. Make sure, I mean, do, do all of this. Make sure that you are willing to sacrifice your preference in order for others to be built up. That's what it's communicating. Don't you know not to seek your own good, but the good of your neighbor, verse 24? But I wanna do this, right? We want everything to be fair, right? We stomp our, we want everything to be fair. Right? Yeah. You have kids and those kids, they grow up and you just, you're like, hey, I'm gonna spoil them. And so then you buy them a bag of Skittles. And then if you're a parent like me, because you don't want them to have too much sugar, you only buy one pack, but you have four kids and there's a dilemma. Because then you have what? You have, like who puts an odd number in the Skittle bag? So then I'm, I, I, I found myself one day, I was cutting a Skittle in half. And I said, what has my world come to? Everybody wants everything to be equal. Now, this is a long time ago, and this is not my kids today. They're amazing. But I go, man, what are we doing? We want everything to be equal. And who are you to tell me what to do? And I want, wait, why do they get two donuts and I only get one donut? That's not fair. Get over it. Listen, if you're looking out for other people's good anyway, if that's your priority, if that's your priority is looking out for others, giving God glory, and edifying others. You don't have time to look in the mirror at yourself. And by the way, if you didn't recognize this, I know you're concerned about what other people think about you. The older you get, the more you recognize other people don't think about you. <laughs> it's so true. Well, what are they gonna think? They ain't gonna think a thing. They're not thinking about you. They're so concerned thinking about themselves. They don't have time to think about you. Did I get a hallelujah? We're going gospel. Look at us. So then he just says, that's the, you got to know. First movement, get rid of idols. Second movement, you have a conscience that is determined by God. He, he talks about what I just read. He kept saying, I don't mean your conscience, right? 
But why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? Conscience is mentioned in verse 25, 27, 28, twice in verse 29. So whenever you see words repeated like that, let's go back and look at it again. So he kept looking at conscience, 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 conscience. Conscience is used over and over. And yes, it can be determined, it is determined by God. Paul's use of conscience is also not only found here, but it's in chapter four, verse four, chapter eight, verse seven, um, chapter eight, verse 10, uh, chapter eight, verse 12. Um, it's in Second Corinthians over and over. He uses it all the time. He finds it, you can find it in First Thessalonians, you can find it in First Timothy, because he's letting people know what it really is. And, and our conscience is the faculty in our soul to distinguish between right and wrong. C.S. Lewis, when he was writing Chronicles of Narnia, right, he used to be an atheist. And in his writing, he discovered, and everybody's, everybody knows right from wrong. There has to be a higher being because we had this innate thing. We know what's right and wrong. Otherwise, people wouldn't do wrong and then run or hide. As soon as you go, I'm going to do this, but I don't want anybody to see it, or I don't want my mom and dad to know, what is that? It's your conscience. And then you have a choice to make in, in that moment of whether or not you're going to listen to the conscience or whether you're gonna give in to self-desire. And many will give in to self-desire and so then we have to hide it. Conscience, and I took three definitions from other people and I put it all together for one, okay? So not from me, but from a lot of different scholars here. Don't wanna claim it. Conscience is inner awareness. It responds to our existing understanding of the world. For the believer, for the believer, this should be developed and shaped by God's revelation through the Bible. Who here was around in the year 2000? Raise your hand. Okay. Anybody notice since then the world's changed a lot? Has anybody noticed that? Raise your hand again. Good or bad, it doesn't matter. It's changed. It's going so quick. Everybody says, well, it's because of technology. You have access to everything. That's, that, is, that is true. But can I tell you the real reason it's changed so quickly? Is because we have stepped away from allowing the Bible to guide our conscience. Your mind would be boggled if you know the number of people who come to this church, even sometimes from other churches and say, man, I've never opened the Bible. What? I mean, what point of, there's, listen, if we're not gonna preach the Bible, I have to get a new job because there's no need for us to be a church. There's no need. And the Bible, listen, what we did is even in the church, we started removing the preaching of the truth for placating the ears of the sinner. And as a result, we removed this conscience, the real reason for the world falling off of a cliff so quickly. And if you know the bigger world and if you travel and you see what's really going on is because we've stepped away from truth. And friends, you can't define morality apart from Jesus. And all of these things start spinning and they start happening. And what it does is it causes this vast, enormous wave of self. Remember the greatest idol that we have, which he's already addressing, uh, addressing, which in terms of fleeing from idolatry, and he keeps talking about it. The greatest idol that we have today is self. We want to worship self. We, we, that's why we don't have time to think about other people. And so here he is. He's like, you have this conscience and you need to listen to this conscience. It's this person's, it's your internal witness to your own behavior of choosing right over wrong. And our conscience and the decisions that you make is your, one of the greatest witnesses you have to a hurting world. And so we call this out. So he's like, flee idolatry. And then he's like, run, run from idolatry. And he says, then, friend, your conscience has to be determined by God. And right now you're letting your decisions, your conscience be determined by the world. And it's gonna get you in a lot of trouble. And then 31 through 33, last section. Told you, we're going quick. And this is, this is the crux of what he's been communicating, all right? And this is what he says. So 
whether you eat or drink or everything you do says something about you. Hello. Everybody say hello. <laughs> Can't believe sometimes when you go along with things. Right. <laughs> Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be what? Saved. This is the word of God. Whatever you do. So here, here, I told you three movements. First movement, run from idolatry. Second movement, our conscience is determined by God. Third movement, be all in for God's glory. Because he says, whether you eat, and, eat or drink. And that's one thing, like, okay, I'm gonna make sure that I eat well and that's a witness, I'm, not, I'm gonna do this right, right? Or, or maybe it's what you drink. And some of you, listen, drinking is a major issue in terms of alcohol and you just can't put it down. Friends, if you have to go home from work, let me help you out here, okay? Make it real life. If you go home from work and you don't know what to do with yourself unless you put a beer in your hand, that means it's an idol. Some of you probably just got really upset with me and you may never come back, but I'd rather, I'd rather you hear the truth. If that's what you have to do in order to know what to do with yourself, that is an idol. If you can't imagine having fulfillment and a peaceful night without putting a can of beer in your hand or a glass of whiskey in your hand, and that's the only way you can do it, it's an idol. And we have all these idols sitting in our lives and what we don't even recognize is we're actually being held captive by them. And it keeps us from listening and hearing because we've already filled our cup with so many different things that we don't allow enough room for the Holy Spirit to come and to indwell, just have his indwelling, his living within us. And so we start holding those rocks and those things that matter so much to us and we don't even know how it's just, just it's destroying our soul. And now all of a sudden that conscience is shifting because the drinking matters more than the word of God. And so we're starting to shift our decisions because now our decisions are being made as long as I don't have to give this up. You see what just happened? So whatever you eat, whatever you drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. You want, here's a key. It's not only the two questions that you need to ask yourself before you make a decision. Does it give God glory and does it edify others? But the key is, here comes Paul and he says, listen, don't, don't give an offense to other people. It's just not worth it. I know that you're, you have the right, you have the liberty to, to offend other people, but why would you offend other people if it's gonna be a detriment to your witness? Just don't do it. He says, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage. That's the thing. The reason he's able to look at giving glory to God is because he set aside seeking his own advantage. He set aside thinking, but this is what I deserve. Don't you know how hard I worked? I deserve this. No. It's not like that. It's all a gift from him. Listen, friends, if you don't know, I didn't say this other service. In a couple of weeks, this church is blessing my family by going on a, a sabbatical and, and resting and, and getting ready for some other things that are coming. But that's just a gift. I, I don't deserve that. That's a gift. That's all that is. And so we set aside seeking anything for our own advantage in order that others may be saved. In order for others to know the glory and the mercy and the forgiveness and the grace of an almighty God, because we know that the majority of the people in the world are chasing so many other idols and yet there's one true God and he is worthy of our glory, all that we can muster up, all that we can heap at his feet. He's worthy of all of that. 
And so we don't run home and do the same thing that we keep doing every week and just keep living for self. What we do is we go, no, 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 I've already got my cup full. And then if, if other things can fit in that, and if I can show that it's giving God glory and edifying, edifying others, then, then, then maybe I'll put that in there. To give glory means to shine, to radiate the majesty of the name of Christ. Not to be a little dim, like, oh, are they shining a little? Is that, is, is that light on? No, no, no. It means to radiate, to shine the glory of the Almighty. Friends, to give glory to God, it has to be deep in you. That's something I'm learning more and more. Right, if you've known Christ for 10 years, five years, three years even, and you're trying to figure out, do I really wanna give my life to him? That means you never submitted to him. But when you submit to the glory of God, it's something, it burns in you and it's something you have to do. It starts to penetrate your thinking in every part of life. It burns in you. It forces you to use that as a decision-making quality in where you go to school and what you do for a living and how you speak to others and what you're willing to eat or drink in all things you give God glory. It burns in you. Are you burning to give God glory? Like burning. Are you burned? Like, does it ache in you? I have to give God glory because of what he did for me. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And I know that sin, the wages of sin is death, but I have life eternal through Jesus Christ. That's the good news. That's the gospel. And when it burns in you, you will ache to give him glory. I don't have to convince you. You're telling me to preach longer. You're telling me to go everywhere that we can and preach the good news, to sacrifice anything we need to sacrifice because giving God glory burns in your soul. Going, it's Father's Day. I'm not going there today. We put the next slide up. I'll give you some real life examples. I'm so tired of trying to convince the person who claims to know Jesus to live for Jesus. Oh. Am I being too raw? how broken we are. Do you get it? We are nothing without him. So how do I glorify God? Simple ways in these things. I'll just give you five quick, these are my examples. In marriage, I have to show grace. That's how I show the glory of God. My wife, I'm married. She doesn't do everything my way which means I know she doesn't do everything the right way, but um, I'm kidding. (laughs) If it's funny enough, it can be a little rude, okay? So it's, no, like, like, and it's still, we always use this as an example, but the way she does toothpaste, like I have to push it up from the bottom. She said, I know when one of my kids or my wife has used my toothpaste. I just, I'm like, I will buy you your own toothpaste. Stop using mine. I can't, I'm like, I'm not a perfectionist, but right up to the line. Right, I'm right there. And I'm like, push it up from the bottom. It keeps it nice and neat. Nothing else in my life is nice and neat. Can I just have my own toothpaste? <laughs> and so I demonstrate that by showing a lot of grace because she doesn't, just because she doesn't do it my way doesn't mean she's not godly in the way she does it. I have an amazing wife. And so in marriage, I show a lot of grace. She doesn't have to do it my way. In friendship, I have to write down, text my friends. Encourage them to be bold in Jesus because I'll forget. And so you may be like, oh, you're weak because you have to remind yourself. No, I think I'd be weak if I wouldn't remind myself. In financial, I have to give sacrificially. I think it is a biblical requirement to give sacrificially. And so a tithe, when you've been tithing your whole life, guess what a tithe ends up not being? Sacrificial. You just get used to it. 
So my family, my wife and I have to sit down and go, this doesn't hurt anymore because we've just gotten used to it. I know we could go buy this car every year or whatever it is, right? I know we could do these things, but it's not sacrifice anymore because we're so accustomed to it. So we have to, cha- we have to change the way we give. I want it to hurt at least a little bit when I already have so much. Time is just giving priority to scripture and to serving. Technology is protecting your eyes. Giving God glory is hard, friends. It takes work. But is it worth it? Is he worthy of it? I say we give God more glory. Give God glory to give God glory to give God glory. Say it with me. Give God glory. Give God glory, right? Like it should just, it's deep in you. It just comes out. I got to give God glory. I got to figure it out. And so that is the prayer. God, I come before you. Love you. I praise you. I worship you. I declare your goodness. May we give you glory. Oh, God, seize our hearts. Seize our hearts. In Christ's name.